Oh, hey. started a minute or two ago so let's see Just wait a minute see if people come on how's running going uh <laughs> yeah. i didn't really try to lift more recently oh yeah yeah that's good yeah but but i have i have still what type of lifting are you doing um, just whatever just trying to get back into it honestly I don't know. It's hard to balance both. It takes a while to get good at both, yeah. like to be able to do both effectively. And either way, you're you're suffering one or the other. Like, <laughs> exactly. meaning you're gonna do not as good as you could do year, in both. Yeah. Exactly. But you can still do pretty well. You know, I mean, I've been able to not right now, but late, let's just say I was hitting both as hard as I can, and I'm doing a little bit more lifting now than running. Yeah. But um, at my, you know, when if I. Right now, like in the shape I'm in, if I if I was really a, trying to maximize both, I think I could do. I could probably do like a 19 minute 5k, maybe dip into the high 18s, like oh. on the right course, right day, you know, yeah. let's say, um, and be able to do like high fours in the deadlift, like high threes and squat, you know, yeah. be able to do both of those back to back. Like I could I could hit that on the same week, you know, but. Which is which is good. It's like good performance in yeah. both. But like if I did one or the other, right. I could do a bit more in both. Yeah, you know what I mean. But that's also years. I've been doing that forever. Like I, even in high school, I lifted and ran. Like I did both, and I tried to do both hard. You know, so yeah, pretty consistently. But it takes it takes a while to get used to it. Best thing you can do is go back and forth. Yeah. Meaning one day go to the gym hard, next day run hard. Yeah. Next day go to the gym hard. I've been doing like because I haven't had time, so I've been doing. Running and lifting the same day. You can do that too, yeah. but be consistent. Let yourself rest, and even when you're sore, go back in. Because yeah. a lot of it is um, energy system management. Mm -hmm. You're like your body's like, wait a second, what are you trying? What do you want me to do? Do you want me to store more glycogen? You know, or or do you want me to work more on aerobic capacity? You know, it's like which which one? But the answer is, I want you to do both. And eventually, your body goes, okay, I kind of get it, and you know, mitochondrial stores will go up and glycogen storage will go up and, and aerobic capacity will go up it just takes longer you know and it's, it's tough. Too, so. yeah it's all different well then what you end up doing is you become an uh intermediate muscle fiber specialist yeah. you know uh, like where you're not going to be you're not going to be real you know pure fast switch or pure slow switch you're yeah. going to be the in-betweens it then they're gonna they're gonna shift a little yeah. bit and, and they're adaptive you know um i don't know it, it does work, but it's hard. <laughs> it takes a long time to get it well. There's a guy, if you ever want to look at a guy who does, who really does a lot with that, I'm trying to think, pretty sure, I'll double check it, but I think his name is Nick Bear. Oh, yeah. B-A-R-E, yeah. right? Yeah, he's yeah, a no, big guy. Fitness, yeah. Okay, so he tries to do both. He's, yeah, he's, he's a big lifter, and he's also a big runner. Mm -hmm. You know, so you'll see him, like, trying to break five-minute mile and stuff like that, and also, at the same time, maintaining his totals and, and lifting and stuff. So he, he's one guy on YouTube that I think is pretty good that he will give you the honest struggle about doing both of those things, and it's tough. You know, We got a couple people? At least somebody. Somebody said I'm here, right? Courtney. All right, Courtney. Good morning. All right. Um, so I don't know if the white balance, maybe just try to turn that on and off. See, it's, maybe it looks a touch yellow. There we go. Yeah, that's good. All right. Um, so we're going to finish up posterior side. Uh, and, and for anybody on here, I apologize about not getting the quizzes up. I honestly completely forgot about it. And then somebody texted me to say, Hey, are you going to put up those quizzes? Which I, I appreciate. So, uh, I'm going to do it as soon as we're done today. So I'm going to post up this lecture and then I'll post up, um, 
the quizzes. So, and, and that's something I, again, I completely apologize and, and I'm thankful for the reminder because I just totally slipped my mind, but I'll get those up. Uh, the only caveat I'm going to put that in there is for the, um, anterior side arteries. We had that pretty large variation. So that's not going to be represented on the quiz, right? The quiz is going to show from last semester and it's going to show a little bit different vasculature. So I'll put a note up uh, right, right under that quiz saying, Hey, everything is good on this, except for the arteries. You just want to refer to, um, our recording with that alternate drawing for our body, just for that one part, but everything else would be the same. The nerves are the same. Um, all the other stuff is the same uh, arteries and veins everywhere else, except for in the beginning around the subclavian and axillary artery in the upper extremity. So that would be the only thing is you want to just watch out for is that the quiz is going to represent it a bit differently because our body has some variations there, but outside of that, everything else will work. So, um, and for the lower extremity, it's almost the same. The only exception there and it's slight would be, um, around the femoral artery and deep femoral with those medial and lateral femoral circumflex arteries. Every cadaver you come to is going to be just a touch different there. But the way I explained it um, on the recording where I was talking about looking for the femoral artery splitting first and then look for a branch going medially and laterally off of either femoral or deep femoral, as long as you're kind of approaching it that way, it won't matter. Uh, what you see because you're going to be able to make sense out of it. So uh, I think even though the quiz cadaver is a touch different there, I, the medial lateral femoral circumflex branch is slightly different on that, slightly differently on that one. Um, you should still be able to follow it based upon the way I, that I ask it. Um, and also showing you the direction that the arteries are going in. It should be pretty uh, self-explanatory there. But again, you're going to want to refer to our recording just for that one specific part because it is just slightly different. So, um, all right, let's uh, orient ourselves here. So we're going to move out just a touch. So I'm going to take a little bit of a wider view first because I want to do just a little bit of osteology um, along with our muscles here just to give you some better placement. Sorry, so I'm taking just a bit more of a bird's eye view. We're going to zoom back in. Don't worry. Just want to get us out a little bit. All right. So here um, we have the male cadaver. He's face down now. So we're looking at the gluteal region here. And right up here, here's the crest of the ilium. So here's the top of the hips. So that's superior there. Move down this way. This is more inferior. So we're going down towards the feet that way. Here's the sacrum right along here. So that's medial and that's lateral. You can see his hand here, right? So we're looking at the gluteal region, superior, inferior, medial, lateral. And right now I am uh, on the left-hand side. Okay. Uh, so let's just orient the bones a little bit here. So let's hold this guy up in place now. So here's, here's the um, coxal bones here, pelvis, right? And we can see Here's the sacrum, right? Like that, we'll move it up a little bit. There's the sacrum there. And I'm right along that same spot right here. So the coccyx is right down here, right? There's the coccyx, kind of hold it in place there. And then we said the crest of the ilium is there. So we'll kind of line that up just about like that, right? So you can see my fingers on the crest of the ilium and that matches up right here. So on the outside of the ilium here, pushing against that, that is the gluteal surface of the ilium. And that's where all the gluteal muscles are going to attach. So we can kind of palpate that, right? And just like we had around the front, we had anterior iliac spines. We had an anterior superior and an anterior inferior iliac spine. Here on the back end, we also have posterior iliac spines. The only one we're going to be able to palpate is if you follow the iliac crest all the way to the back, you're going to feel the posterior superior iliac spine. So we're going to come up, 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 up. And then right here, we're going to feel, I'll just kind of line it up. So this spot here is going to be that spot down there, posterior superior iliac spine. We can palpate that spot. All right. Without moving anything, we're not going to be able to feel anything else yet, but we will come back to this because we're going to be able to palpate a couple of other spots on here. Once we start reflecting the gluteal muscles, we're also going to, um, Show some spots on the femur as well. So let me grab my femur. 
Um, but I'm not going to show those until we start moving the gluteal muscles out of the way. Uh, okay. So let's start with the three gluteal muscles. And that, those are going to be the first couple muscles we're going to begin with. And if you're following along on the handouts, you're going to want to be on lower extremity lab, posterior thigh. That's where you want. Or, or do I have it split out as gluteal region? I'm... Either posterior thigh or gluteal region. I think I just have it on posterior thigh. I don't, I don't remember. Um, but no, nah, it's okay. They'll see it. It's, I don't remember. If it's broken out to gluteal, then that section, if not posterior thigh. Um, but the first three muscles you're going to run into are going to be gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and gluteus minimus. All right, those three. And they're listed in order from superficial to deep. So they're layered on top of each other. So we have three, right? Gluteus maximus would be the most superficial, then medius, then minimus. So they're layered on top of each other. Um, they're also listed in order from biggest to smallest. All right. Gluteus maximus is the largest muscle in your body, and it's the biggest of those three. Then medius a little smaller, then minimus a little smaller. All right. So gluteus maximus we can see right here, and it's this muscle that we have cut, and we needed to cut this one to move it out of the way. So you can see here's one part of gluteus maximus here. And then here's the other part of gluteus maximus there. And you can see that this muscle is very thick, right? So it's, it's the largest muscle in your body here. And if we're looking at the fibers, we can see them. You can see the lines of action are going in this direction like that, okay? So here's the top edge of the muscle. There's the bottom edge of the muscle, right? Here's where it attaches to the sacrum and also just the um, proximal end of the iliac crest here. And then we come down this way and we attach to two things distally here, right? Um, one of them, and we're going to do this. So let's just move this part of the glutes out. So here's the distal end of the glutes, all right? And what I want you to see is this part of gluteus maximus right here in between my two fingers, that attaches directly to the femur right here, all right? So about the inferior one-third of this muscle right onto the femur. And I'm pushing against the femur right here. I mean, it's a little covered up, but this is the femur right here, all right? So we're attached there. Then look at the upper two thirds of the muscle, all this, right? Down to right where my finger is, right there. So all of this here, that goes down, does not attach here, right? Instead, watch where my finger is. So I'm gonna push my finger, see there's a passageway here. Now I'm gonna flip this up and you see my finger moving underneath down there, see it? Right here. See my finger there? What my finger is under here is that IT band that we had mentioned last time. So let me move the hand out of the way. IT band here. That's what I'm moving. So the upper two thirds of gluteus maximus attaches distally to the IT band. And remember, what's the IT stand for? Ilio, the ilium, tibia down there, right? So since gluteus maximus here attaches the IT band, indirectly it's all the way going down towards and attaching to the tibia. All right, so part of this gluteus maximus right to the femur here. Most of it though attaches actually to the tibia. Now, you want to note though that because the IT band, and we saw this last time, you can go back and look at that last uh, lecture or the lab, I'm sorry, thinking of the wrong word, recording for the lab we did on the anterior side of the lower extremity. Uh, I showed you the IT band being a part of and connected to the fascia lata, which surrounds the entire thigh, right? So the IT band is fixated in place. It doesn't slide up or down, right? So it's held in place because it's attached to the rest of the fascia of the thigh. Because of that, even though technically gluteus maximus attaches to the tibia, it's not going to cause any movement of the tibia. Right? It's going to act like it pulls on the femur, even though a lot of it doesn't actually connect to the femur. And that's just because it attaches to that IT band, and the IT band is fixated and it doesn't move. All right. Um, so just note that difference here. And note that my finger can go under, and then I'm attached to the IT band there. All right. So we got that for gluteus maximus. So let's put this back in place. So we're going to identify these, and then we'll talk about the functions. All right. So that's gluteus maximus. If we want to see uh, gluteus medius, the next one, we're going to have to um, open up gluteus maximus like this. So let's let's reflect this side back. Let's see if we get that to stay up a little bit. And then we're going to open up this side. So we kind of open that up like that. And I'm going to outline this. The next muscle we uncover is right here. 
All right, and this is going to be gluteus medius. And I'm just going to lift it up a little bit so you can see which, see if I move it around, you can see it a little bit better. All right, so here's the bottom edge. So it goes to here, goes up like this, and it actually goes underneath of gluteus maximus a little bit. It's up, up here, but it passes under gluteus maximus. All right, so we come down here, we go up this way along the crest of the ilium, back down. So that whole area there is going to be gluteus medius. So it's this one that I'm moving right like that. And then if we move gluteus medius out of the way, down in there, underneath of it, and largely where my finger is, so it's kind of covered up, but we can see it a little bit right there. That's going to be gluteus minimus down in here. And you can see that it continues up underneath of gluteus medius. Okay, so you can see how they're all kind of layered on top of each other. One, two, three there from superficial to deep all right gluteus maximus gluteus medius gluteus minimus and you see all they're all stacked up on each other like that okay um so that's the identification let's let's talk about movements so let's put this back a little bit all right and um for gluteus maximus um this one we're crossing the posterior side of the hips like this okay so part of this is oriented vertically and part of it's oriented horizontally right so if this muscle is going to pull this way or it's going to pull this way right that if i pull like this that's going to be a combination of me pulling in these two directions vertical and horizontal like that that's going to give me that motion right so the vertical component pulling like this is going to be extension or hyperextension of the thigh at the hip. Now we know though, we can also move the pelvis. So we can also pull this way, which would be extension or hyperextension of the pelvis at the hip. So we can do either one, right? So we know that anything at the hips is going to operate in both directions. So that'll be the vertical component. It's going to be extension or hyperextension of the hips, either of the thigh or the pelvis at the hips, right? Which is what we expect. So we know all the stuff that cross the anterior side of the hip joint, we're all hip flexors, things that cross the posterior side of the hip joint are hip extensors, all right? So that's one part, that's the vertical component. Horizontal component, again, is gonna pull this way. And I'm gonna grab a femur here to show you, all right? So if the femur is gonna sit like this, and actually, remember that it's covered up. So really the femur sits, it's really, underneath it here like that right but um if we kind of hold it like this notice how see how this wraps around the femur so we're going to attach to the femur by going over the top of it and attaching to the lateral side of the femur and that is if i kind of line it up right here is like right here all right see this spot here that is that spot right there okay here here. And I'm going to go over those, those features in just a second. I just want you to orient it like that, right? So this part of the muscle would be wrapped around the bone like that. It's going to pull on this side. So when I pull horizontally like this and I'm grabbing over here, see, I'm going to want to roll the femur. And that is going to be external rotation or lateral rotation of the uh, femur or of the thigh at the hip. Right? And we know that also it can move the pelvis, so you can do external or lateral rotation of the pelvis at the hip as well. All right? And it's because we're wrapping around. We're going around the posterior side of the femur and attaching to the lateral side of it. So when we pull, it wants to roll it this way. Okay? And that'll be external or lateral rotation. Um, and again, the reason it's external, I know when you're looking at this, you go, wait a second, it's turning in. Why is that not internal rotation and that's because we're on the posterior side of the body we're on the anterior side of the body and we and we rolled it this way that would be internal rotation because we're on the posterior side it's reversed right so we're pulling this way and it's actually turning the bone out this way would be turning it in all right the anterior side rolled in that would be internal rotation here we're looking at the posterior side of the bone that rolls in like that, that's actually external rotation. So again, just make sure you flip-flop those things. Depends on whether you're looking at the anterior or posterior side to know which way is internal or external rotation. Uh, all right, so we got those two things for gluteus maximus. So let's go to gluteus medius. Move that up out of the way again. All right, and what we want to note about gluteus medius, and again, I'll just kind of grab it. It's this guy 
right here that I'm moving around, this one, is that we're going from the ilium, the crest of the ilium, and also the outer surface of the ilium, which is the gluteal surface of the ilium. And we're coming down this way, and we're attaching to this bony spot right here, which is what I was just showing you before. Let's put the femur back in like that, and it's this bony spot right here. See, we're coming down here is right there, and kind of line it up. This is the greater trochanter of the femur, All right, greater trochanter of the femur. We're attaching right to that. Now, this muscle comes down and attaches right here on the lateral side of that greater trochanter, like this, right, so pulling. So when it pulls, what does it do? It pulls the femur out to the side like that, right? This one pulls, the femur goes out. And that's abduction, B as in boy, abduction of the thigh at the hip, and again, or of the pelvis at the hip. So gluteus medius, that is your number one by far uh, hip abductor. And it's very, very, very strong. All right. The way we use gluteus medius most of the time is when we walk. Let's just put the pelvis back here. Let's kind of do this. Let's kind of get this where we lined up right about like that. And let's get this guy kind of lined up like that. Now, this, this whole body is not exactly the same size as these bones, right? So it's a little off like this, right? But what you want to know is when you take a step, and actually, you know what? I'm going to show this on me real fast. I'll show it on me, and then I'll, I'll kind of reiterate it on the body here. But I want you to see this. We'll see how well I can do this for you guys. It's not a natural way to move, but I think I can demonstrate it. Oops. A little bit. There we go. Let's see how that is. Let's see how far away we need to be. Eh, all right. I'm going to tilt it down just a touch. I really want you to be able to see my feet better than my hips. Let's see how this is. Just wiggle in the camera. Uh, that's pretty good. Okay. So what I want you to see is that when I walk, right, and I go and I'm going to start taking a step, I have to lift up one foot or the other, right? So I'm going to pick up my right foot. And if I step forward, then I'm going to pick up my left foot, right? Walk towards the camera. I can walk away, right? I'm picking my feet up. We all, you know, that's just basic walking, right? But when we do that, if you look at the hips, so if we put like a laser level on the crest of your hips while you were walking, and I'm going to start back here, and I'm just going to take steps, and I'm going to walk. If I had a level on my hips here, the crest of my hips are not going to change their elevation at all. So nothing's going to happen to my hips. They're going to stay rock solid the whole time. The reason for that is because when I lift up my right foot, so I go to take a step, and I pick up my right foot, the hip abductor on my left side contracts. So gluteus medius right now on the left is contracting when I pick up my right foot. And what that's doing, it's preventing the hip from dipping like this, right? So it keeps my hips level and it doesn't allow the, the hip to dip down this way. Then I put my right foot down and I lift up my left foot. And now the hip abductor, gluteus medius on the right side is contracting and it's preventing my hips from tilting down this way, right? So it keeps the hips level. So you guys can feel this. If you, if you got up, stand up right now and just walk a couple of steps with your hands rested right on the sides of the hip joint. So just put your hands right here. Okay. And just take a couple steps, walk a little bit, and you're going to feel that whatever foot you pick up, the opposite gluteus medius muscle is going to contract. You're going to feel those gluteus medius muscles doing this while you're walking, right? The opposite. So I'm sorry, my hands are not on screen. The opposite side is contracting as you're taking a step, you'll feel it, right? That's how we use gluteus medius most of the time. It does hip abduction, but it does it to prevent the hips from drooping, right? So what we don't want, again, if we put the pelvis here, when we walk, we don't want the hips to be doing this. Instead, when you walk, the hips are rock solid. The only thing moving here is the femurs on either side. And gluteus medius is contracting to prevent the hips from dipping 
to one side or the other. We don't want that tilt side to side. Right? So hopefully that makes sense. But that's how we use uh, gluteus medius most of the time. It's for locomotion, running, walking, to maintain the stability and the levelness right, of, of the pelvis side to side. Uh, all right. The last one would be gluteus minimus. So for minimus, again, we're going to take medius and we're just going to move medius out of the way a little bit. We can see minimus here. And again, it was it's mostly underneath of gluteus medius. But what I want you to see is that gluteus minimus has essentially the same exact attachment points as gluteus medius. It goes from the ilium down to the greater trochanter, but it attaches to the greater trochanter in a different way. So in this one, medius goes right down and, like we said, attaches to the lateral side of the greater trochanter. Minimus, watch my finger here. Minimus is going to go down and watch it pass. See, it's going under. I'm underneath of the greater trochanter and I'm attaching to it from the anterior side. Okay. So medius attaches to the greater trochanter laterally. Minimus attaches to the greater trochanter by wrapping around to the anterior side. So let me show you on the, on the femur again, what that looks like. All right. So medius is attaching here. Minimus is going around underneath and it's attaching to the anterior side like that. All right. So one goes here, the other one here. And look at how that changes. If I pull on the greater trochanter by pulling on it this way, we get this abduction, which is what we just talked about. Instead, minimus here by passing around the anterior side and pulling this way, right, does this. When I pull on the front, so I'm pulling here, I'm moving this spot that way, right? And that is going to do that, which is internal rotation of the thigh at the hip. So that's one part of it because it's, it's pulling this way. So part of it is going to act horizontally, internal rotation, right? When I pull like that. And the other part is going to act vertically, but I'm pulling on the anterior side. So what does it do? This. I don't know how well you guys can see that, but it's moving the thigh forward, all right, which is flexion of the thigh at the hip. So you want to note there that even though gluteus minimus is a posterior side muscle, the tendon passes the anterior side of the hips, all right? And that's all we care about is so which way does it pass around the hip joint? It passes on the anterior side, which means this acts like a hip flexor. It acts like the muscles that we saw on the anterior side of the hips. So you're going to put functionally um, gluteus minimus in terms of hip, hip action. You're going to put that synergistically with iliacus, psoas major, rectus femoris, sartorius, any one of the hip flexors that we talked about, gluteus minimus is going to act like those. It's a hip flexor and an internal rotator of the hip. All right. So what we're going to note is that What's the functional relationship between gluteus maximus and gluteus minimus? They are 100% antagonistic to each other. Maximus is a hip extensor and an external rotator. Minimus down there is a hip flexor and an internal rotator. So there, no matter which movement you, you talk about the hips, those two muscles are completely antagonistic to each other. All right. So that takes care of your gluteal muscles. Now, in the same area here, we're going to have six hip stabilizer muscles, six hip stabilizers. Um, and these are going to be uh, equivalent to your rotator cuff muscles. All right. Um, and we're going to, uh, I think, you know, I wonder if I forgot to open that up. So let me take a quick look here. Yeah, can I do that real fast? One second, I'm just looking at something up in the shoulder joint. Did I do it here either? No, I did not open that spot up. All right, well, we'll see what we're doing time-wise at the end. Uh, okay, so um, these are gonna be equivalent to your rotator cuff muscles down here. These are gonna be your hip stabilizers. And again, there are six of them. So when we identify these, I'm going to number them first. I'm going to show you all six. We'll kind of number them. Then uh, we'll go back and we'll lay the names on top. So in order to find these, you are going to begin by locating this large nerve that we can see here. See this really big thing I'm moving around here? This is a nerve. 
and this is your sciatic nerve. All right, we're going to come back and re-identify this, but everybody can see that we have this really large uh, vessel going down here. And again, that's your sciatic nerve. So you're going to find sciatic nerve first. We're going to trace the sciatic nerve proximally up here. And we can see right there where it emerges from the pelvis. All right. Once we see that spot, we're going to go just above it and the muscle that we run into, and I'm just going to grab it and move it around a little bit, this guy. That is the first stabilizer muscle. This one is called piriformis. Right? That's the first one. So again, you're going to find sciatic nerve, trace sciatic nerve proximally. It's going to point you right to this muscle, points right to it, and that is the first hip stabilizer muscle, which is piriformis. So that's number one right there. All right, now let's go down from that spot. So we got one here, and we're going to move inferiorly. We're going to count our way up here. Let me just create a little space right there. So there is one. Here is two. Here is three, four, five. And then the sixth one is located in between and deep to four and five. So to see the sixth one, we're going to move that out of the way a little bit. And then that guy down there, that's number six. So number six is normally covered up. See? Can't really see it because it's in between and deep to four and five. So again, and let me just zoom in just a touch. Whoops. Flip that thing around a little bit. Something like that. There we go. All right, so let's just do that one more time. So again, we find sciatic nerve. We come up, we get to the first one, there's one. And then we got this cluster of three right here. Two, three, four, five, that whole big one there. And then we separate four and five like that, and we find six down there. Okay, so that's where you're going to find all your hip stabilizers. Let's, let's lay the names on them, and, and we'll have them up in the chat there. So we already said the number one is piriformis. Two, superior gemellus. Three, obturator internus. Four, inferior gemellus. Five, quadratus femoris. And then six in there is obturator externus. This guy here. All right. Now, so those are your six. Uh, what we want to note about these is that they are all external rotators of the thigh hip. Watch this. I'm going to externally rotate and watch how they'll all loosen up. See that? All right. Here's that greater trochanter, and I'm turning it. See? Like that, and you can see those muscles loosen. So they're going to all pull this way and turn the thigh out. All right. They're all external rotators of the thigh at the hip. You can really see that. When I, when I do rotate the hip there. Okay. So those are all the hip stabilizers. Um, all right, let's move down. Uh, and now we're going to go down to posterior thigh. So let me move back out a little bit, come up a little higher. All right. Let's slide down a bit here and we'll uncover. Let's see, where am I at here? Okay. I got plenty of room to move back up. Yeah, there we go. All right. So now we're going to look at posterior thigh. Now, here, just a tiny one more thing of osteology here. Let's bring this guy back up. So we're going to kind of put the pelvis back in place here. Right. And right here, right here, you can't see it real well. It's kind of covered up by some vessels, but I'm pushing on a bony point right there, and that is going to be here, all right? I'm just going to move the pelvis back down so we can see it. So here we have the ilium up here. This bone down here at the bottom of the pelvis is the ischium. I'm on the ischium right here, and there is a point, a bump that sticks up on the ischium right here, which is called the ischial tuberosity, and that is what I'm pushing against right here. And what I want you to see is that these muscles on the posterior thigh, look at all these guys here. 
See all these muscles I'm moving around? As I move up, they all connect together and they all originate on that ischial tuberosity there. Right? So all these guys that are moving here, they all join together up here and they all originate on that ischial tuberosity. Okay, so just wanted to see that one bony spot. Okay, when we're looking at posterior thigh muscles, these are your hamstrings. Um, there are four hamstring muscles. Three of them are true hamstrings, and the other one is, the fourth one is not a true hamstring. We'll talk about what the difference is. Um, so when we're trying to find the hamstrings, first thing you want to see is that right here, we can see that these muscles split. Okay, these two, the two I'm holding here, you can see, so we got two muscles there. Two of them are on the posterior medial side of the thigh. And then the other two are over here on the posterior lateral side of the thigh. All right, so that's the first thing you want to find is that split. And no, are we looking at the medial side ones or the lateral side ones? All right, so let's start with the medial side ones first. The two over here on the medial side, they're stacked on top of each other. So we see we got one sitting on top of another one like that. So they're stacked up. That is going to be semi-tendinosis is the more superficial and the skinnier one here. Move that one out of the way. And this thicker, deeper one is semi-membranosis. Okay. So sitting on top here, semi-tendinosis, take that one, move it out of the way. Semi-membranosis is underneath it there. Those are the two. And again, they're on top of each other like this. Tendinosis, membranosis. All right. In that area here. Now we go over to the lateral side. And the two we have here are going to be biceps femoris long head and biceps femoris short head. All right. So we got two, two muscles here. And the one that we're seeing here, this is long head. So I'm going to grab the long head, see, like this. And I'm going to take the long head and I'm going to move it over. And you see this muscle right here. You see this split like that. So it's like this. Okay. This is all long head. Long head kind of sits on top. We move long head out of the way and then short head is down here. Okay. And we can pretty clearly see that the long head is quite a bit longer than the short head, which stops like right about there. All right. So and you can see that split there. Short head, long head. All right. And then notice distally those two join together. So from here down, it's their, their joint. All right. Those are your hamstring muscles. Now, we said that three of them are true hamstrings. And the true ones are the ones that attach up to the ischial tuberosity. All right. And that's going to be semi-tendinosis, semi-membranosis, and biceps femoris long head. But if we grab, so you can see here, I got all three of those here. I'm going to take them all. I'm going to move them out of the way. And pretty clearly, you can see here that the short head right, isn't going in the same direction as the other ones. The short head ends right here on the posterior side of the femur. So this is not a true hamstring. And it's because it doesn't cross the hip joint, all right? So three of them, semitendinosis, membranosis, and biceps femoris long head cross the hips by attaching up here onto the ischial tuberosity. Short head of biceps femoris does not cross the hips because it originates on the femur, all right? So that's the difference between the true and the, and, and the other hamstrings there. All right. Now, as we go down, all of the hamstrings, all four, they all cross the back of the knee and attach to the tibia down here. And they attach either to the medial side of the tibia or the lateral side of the tibia, depending on whether we're talking about semi-tendinosis and membranosis, they attach on the medial side of the tibia, biceps femoris, long and short head attach onto the lateral side of the tibia, but they all cross the knee joint. All right. So that means that the hamstring muscles, the ones that cross the hips, those first three, they do extension or hyperextension of the thigh or the pelvis at the hip. So they would be synergistic to gluteus maximus, is hip extensors. Short head of biceps femoris, this guy, no hip action at all, right? All four of them cross the back of the knee. When they cross the back of the knee, they're going to pull on the tibia this way, which is going to cause, the, and his knee is pretty stiff. I can't really bend it, but it would cause you to to bend your knee, all right? So the knee would bend, that would be flexion of the leg at the knee. That would be all four hamstrings doing that at the knee joint. And that's all we have on the posterior thigh. 
are the hamstrings. That's it. Everything else you're seeing. So if I kind of move some of this stuff out of the way, uh, you can see that, right? But if I, let's see here. Where can we get a good picture? Uh, yeah, you know what? It just looks like it. There's a vessel that burst in here, which is why this is all stained really, really red. It's make it a little hard to see, but I'm pushing against the muscle all through here, all of that. That's all adductor magnus, which sits underneath of all this stuff. So the only stuff that's really on the posterior side are going to be the hamstrings there. And that's it. All right. So let's shift down a little bit more. And let's do posterior leg. So we're going to come down here. And let's shift some of this stuff. Cover back up the glutes. Let's cover back up the hamstrings a little bit. Let's uncover this down here. So I'm going to move out just a touch more so we can see a little bit of the foot here. All right, something like that. So here's the back of the knee. Here's the heel. This is your calcaneus here. So we're looking at posterior leg going from the knee down towards the ankle joint. Um, and posterior leg is going to have three compartments. We're going to have the posterior compartment, which is in the middle. That's the one we're going to start with. Then we're going to have posterior medial and posterior lateral. All right. So we have three compartments here. We're going to start with the posterior compartment first. Uh, and we can kind of see the fascia. See? Kind of open up that posterior compartment here. Um, and that's where we're going to have the first three muscles we're going to look at are what you would consider your calf muscles. And that's going to be gastrocnemius, plantaris, soleus, those three. Gastrocnemius, plantaris, soleus. Those are going to be the three muscles that you would consider your calf muscles. And we're listing them in order from superficial to deep. So gastrocnemius is the most superficial, then plantaris, then soleus. All right. So let's, let's find these. So the first one we find is gastrocnemius, and that is going to be this muscle that I'm moving around here. Now notice, you see how I cut this? See? There's, there's one end of it. See? Right there. We cut a little bit. I did that so that we can move this guy out of the way. But what I want you to note is that gastroc is divided, right? Two heads here. Medial head, that's the one that I cut. Lateral head is the one I left intact. So we got medial head of gastrocnemius, lateral head of gastrocnemius. They join together and they have this long piece of connective tissue that comes down there. That's gastroc, all right? We take the medial head of gastrocnemius and we just move it over a little bit. And the next one we come to, see this long skinny tendon here that I have? Trace that up, 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 and you see that little tiny muscle belly right up here. So you can see me just get up this way like this. See that little muscle belly that I'm moving around? Sorry, I think that focus got, there we go. There's that muscle belly there. That's plantaris. Little tiny muscle belly with a long skinny tendon that's going to go all the way down here. That's plantaris. Move plantaris out of the way. And all the rest of this, all that I'm moving around here, all of that there is all soleus. So we can see soleus on this side. And note that soleus is underneath of these guys, see, over here. And if we move over this way, this is all soleus as well. Right? So kind of push my hands underneath like this. And I got gastroc and plantaris and everything that's under those two. All that really large one there, that's all soleus. All right, and that's also the biggest of the three as well. All right, so we got those three muscles. As we come down this way, we can see my finger underneath this big piece of connective tissue here, this big tendon. This is your Achilles tendon, right? The better name for this, everybody knows it by Achilles, but the better name is the calcaneal tendon calcaneal tendon. You'll also see it referred to as tendocalcaneus, any one of those three names. But the best name there is calcaneal tendon because it's telling you exactly where it goes. All three of those muscles join together, have one common tendon, and that tendon attaches down to your heel bone, which is your calcaneus down there. I can see that here. All right. So those three muscles, um, gastrocnemius and plantaris, the first two both of them cross the back of the knee, all right? So when they contract, they're gonna cause knee flexion, 
All right, they're going to bend the knee, which would be synergistic to all four of your hamstring muscles. All right, so the muscles that bend the knee are going to be all of the hamstrings, all four we did before, plus gastrocnemius, both heads, and plantaris. Those are going to be your knee flexors. All right, now soleus, the deepest one, this one, and we're going to move over to the other side. So we can see soleus come up, 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 and it ends right here. Okay, and this spot that my finger is on is the head of the fibula. All right, ends on the head of the fibula. Now let me grab our bone here so we can see. All right, so we're going to lay the bones on top, and hopefully you guys can see. Here's the here's the distal end of the femur. There's the femur. This is the back of the knee. And then here's your tibia, and here's your fibula. All right, and if we kind of line it up just like that, you can see soleus up here, up, 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 up. And here, this bony spot is this spot right here. That bump sticking out on the side, that is the um, head of the fibula that we're attaching to, and that's right there. But what I want you to see is look at the fibula here, and look what happens if I bend the knee joint. All right, see how the fibula... The head of the fibula is distal to the knee joint, which means that a muscle that starts here and goes down that way doesn't activate on the knee joint at all. So soleus doesn't give us any knee flexion, right? It's only going to activate more distally. But plantaris and gastrocnemius, they attach up here, right? So when they pull, they do cross the knee joint. When this guy pulls down here, right? nothing happens here because it's a little bit more distal. So you just want to note that of those three calf muscles, that soleus does not give us any action at the knee. All right. So what does it do, soleus? It does what the other ones also do down here, which is activate on the ankle joint. So these muscles all combine here. They're going to pull on the calcaneus like this, and that's going to do plantar flexion of the uh, ankle. All right, let me just show that here. So these muscles, right? Again, we're on the posterior side here, and I'm just going to slide down so you can see this. So we have muscles that are pulling on the posterior side on the calcaneus like this. So they're going to pull, and they're going to do that, right? When these muscles pull this way, that happens, and that is plantar flexion. That's like you standing on your tippy toes like that, and that's because they're pulling that way, all right? Uh, now, let's just move down. A little, I just want you to be able to see the foot a little bit better here. So let's take this off. Let's get this guy out of the way. And let me stop the camera from shaking. Sorry. All right. And what I want you to see here is now you can see the bottom of the foot. You can see the calcaneus. Note that those muscles that attach to that calcaneal tendon, that they go straight down to the center of the calcaneus and pull right up on the calcaneus directly from the middle. That means that they are plantar flexors, but they are not going to turn the ankle side to side, which was inversion and eversion. We had talked about that a little bit, and that is you, and this foot is like really doesn't, I can't even barely even move it, but that would be me taking the bottom of the foot and turning it, like tilting it in or out. And so I take the bottom of the foot and I turn it Inwards, and that would be inversion. Take the bottom of the foot and I turn it out. That would be eversion. So that's side-to-side -side movement of the bottom of the foot. That is not going to happen from these guys because they're pulling straight from the middle. We need muscles that are going to go around the calcaneus. So I'm going to have some muscles that will be over here. They're going to go around the calcaneus like this. And when they pull here, it's going to take the bottom of the foot and turn it, tilt it inwards when I'm pulling like this, right? I'm gonna have other muscles that are gonna cross around the calcaneus on the lateral side over here. They're gonna pull this way, which is gonna take the bottom of the foot and tilt it out like that. So the ones that cross the medial side of the ankle joint here are gonna be inverters of the ankle, and ones that cross the lateral side are gonna be everters of the ankle. But the ones in the middle that we just did, they don't do inversion or eversion because they're just pulling straight up on the calcaneus, so no tilting. Of the ankle joint at all. All right. Um, now we have one more muscle in this area, and it's a little deeper. So we're going to move back up just a touch so we can see those. All right, like that. Let's turn this move that back over a little bit so we can see gastroc again. 
move Gastroc, Plantaris, and then we got Soleus here. Now, I'm also going to move Soleus out of the way. I'm just going to pull this back a little bit. And way down here, right here, there is a flat muscle, and I'm just going to outline it for you guys. Let's get this out of the way. There's a flat muscle right there. Now, there's some vasculature on top of it. See, there's some vessels. These are arteries and veins, and they're kind of sitting on top. So we're going to drag those guys out of the way just a touch like that. And this flat muscle that we're seeing down there, this guy, that is called popliteus. Popliteus. And we can just see the distal end of popliteus. Popliteus actually goes up underneath like this, where my finger's going, up a little bit higher to attach up over here. All right. So it's kind of crossing the back of the knee joint like this. Lays right over the posterior side of the knee joint like that. Let me grab those bones and I'll show you how it sits on the bones here. So again, if we put put those bones back up, we got the femur, tibia, fibula. This muscle is crossing the back of the knee joint like this. It attaches onto the tibia here, okay? It goes up and it attaches to the femur up here. So it's laying right across the posterior side of the knee joint like that, all right? Um, again, that's called popliteus. Uh, it gets its name from the fact that it's in the popliteal fossa, which is that um, space on the posterior side of your knee joint. It's called the popliteal fossa, that muscle that crosses it there called popliteus. What does popliteus do for us when it contracts? It unlocks your knee. That's the special function of popliteus. So if you guys stand up right now and just Put your weight on one of your knees or the other. And typically when we do that, we lock the knee joint that we are resting our body weight on, right? So you guys do this all the time. When you're just standing up, you pretty much don't stand up with bent knees. You don't stand for any length of time with a bent knee. That would be like doing a wall sit, right? That gets tiring really, really fast on your uh, thigh muscles. So what do we do? In order to save our thigh muscles, we lock our knees. And when we do that, you'll feel that your thigh muscles relax. Your hamstrings relax, your quads relax when you have one of your knees locked out and your body weight on that side. And it's an energy saving mechanism. We're allowing from our pelvis down to the ground, we're allowing our skeletal system to hold the vast majority of that weight. And the only thing our muscles are doing is balance now. They're not actually supporting the body weight. They're just maintaining balance. All right. But as soon as you bend your knee, so crack your knee, Whatever side you're resting your body weight on, if you're standing up and doing this, just rest your body weight on one side. So say your left knee is locked out. We have all of our body weight resting on our left lower extremity. Just unlock your left knee while your body weight is resting on there. And as soon as you do that, right, you're going to feel your thigh muscles contract. You're going to feel your quadriceps take all of that body weight. So that transition from a locked knee to an unlocked knee that allows the rest of your thigh muscles to take the body weight, that is going to be what popliteus does for us. It initiates the unlocking or the flexion of the knee joint, that initial couple degrees, that then allow the rest of the muscles around the joint to take your body weight and take over. All right? So that's what popliteus does for us. Just helps unlock the knee. All right. Um, so that is the posterior compartment. We have the three calf muscles, gastrocnemius, plantaris, soleus, and then we move all those out of the way. And then under that, that last one, popliteus, that crosses the posterior side of the knee joint. All right. Now we're going to go to the posterior lateral side. And looking at this, I forgot to open up the fascia. So we're going to do that together right now. So what we want to see is, look at this. Here's that fascia that covered over the calves. See? Like that, so I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to turn. And hopefully you guys can see that there's a tendon going right down here. So there's another compartment. Look at this. Here, this is a good picture. Here's a flap of fascia from the anterior side. This, this was the flap that covered over those anterior leg muscles that we did last time, right? Here's the flap that covers over the calf muscles right there. And notice how when I'm moving this around that there's a space in between. See this, this channel? right here. And that is going to be the posterior lateral compartment. So we're going to open this up like that. And we're going to find two muscles in here. Both of these muscles are going to be named after the bone that they're running along, which is the fibula. So we're going to have two fibularis muscles here. It's going to be fibularis longus and fibularis brevis. 
Okay, so let's let's get these two guys. So let's open this up here. So let's just grab a little bit of this fascia here, and I'm just going to score it a little bit along here so that we can get through the fascia here. A really dull blade. Let's see if I can actually make a. There we go. All right. so get through that and grab my scissors. All right, let's get inside this little pocket here. All right, so you can see the scissors there inside the pocket. And look, you notice how I can't go any farther that way. Can't go any farther that way because that those are the edges of the pocket. So it's real skinny little pocket here. So let's cut that fascia like that. Go down a little farther there. Let's go up a little bit. All right, you can see I'm still inside of that pocket there. Cut that up here. We'll go up as far as we reasonably can. About, I think about like that is probably about as far as we can go. Because the muscles really start adhering to the fascia higher up. So we'll just kind of open that up there. And let's just make a little cut side to side so that kind of stays out like that. There. That, and then this side comes down. That'll pretty much stay out of the way there. All right, so let's turn this back out. So you can see we opened up this little pocket of fascia. This is the posterior lateral compartment here. And again, we said we had two muscles, fibularis longus, fibularis brevis. You're going to note that longus is more superficial, and that is what we're seeing the tendon of right here. This is fibularis longest. So let me lift that tendon up so we can move it out of the way. So we're going to get in here and we're just going to separate right there. And we're just cutting through a little bit of that glue that binds these muscles together. We got that. And then let's get over on the other side over here. Open that up. Like that. Let's get this guy up out of the way a little bit. About like that. All right. So this one here, then I'm moving. This is fibularis longus, this guy. And then if we take longus and we move it out of the way, we can see that we have another muscle underneath of it, and that will be fibularis brevis. You see how the one sits on top of the other there. Now, they continue off a bit further, so they're located way up here underneath the fascia. It's just that in this area, the fascia is very adhered to the contractile part of these muscles, so it'll just rip the muscles apart if I try to peel it off up here, so I'm not going to. I'm just going to separate it right here, down where they're a little bit more tendinous. It's just easier to see, but you should pretty clearly be able to see we have two muscles sitting right on top of each other. Again, fibularis longus is the more superficial one. Fibularis brevis is the deeper one. Both of those muscles originate on the fibula. They go down along the fibula this way, and they cross the lateral side of the ankle joint, right? So both of these muscles are going to pull this way on the foot, which is going to be that plantar flexion, right? It's going to move the bottom. And again, his ankle joint doesn't move very well, but like you're standing up on your tippy toes, plantar flexion. But they both also shorten up on the lateral side of the ankle joint, which means they're going to do eversion. They're going to take the bottom of the foot and turn it out like that, eversion of the ankle joint because they're shortening up this way. So those would be the posterior lateral ones. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, so posterior lateral means they're doing plantar flexion, eversion, right? Both of those muscles there. Okay. Let's go over to the other side. So we did posterior, posterior, lateral. Now we're going to do the ones that are on the posterior medial side over here. Now, in order to see those muscles, what we need to do is take the calf muscles, gastroc and plantaris and soleus, and move them out of the way. So we can take gastroc out of the way. We can take plantaris out of the way. And now we're going to take soleus. We're going to get that out of the way as well. And over here, you can see that we have some muscles in this area. These are the posterior medial side muscles. Now, in order to be able to identify the difference between these, we're going to look at them right down here 
as they're starting to cross the ankle joint. That's where we're going to differentiate these muscles down here. Now, I do want you to note that we have a variation here, a unique one that I've never seen before. Um, and for right now, I'm just going to tell you what muscle it is and, and we'll make sense out of it in, in a little bit. But we have an extra thing here that we would not normally see. And it actually messed me up in the beginning because I, I couldn't figure out why I was cutting through a muscle where I should not have been cutting through a muscle. So I did damage this one just a touch because I've never seen anything like it before. Um, but again, you know, some of us have additional muscles. Some of us are missing ones. There's a lot of variation in the muscles and it's perfectly fine. It's just, just what I just wasn't expecting it. Right. So we have all of those calf muscles out of the way. We're opening up in this area here. Now you see this thing, see this muscle that I'm moving around here. This is an extra one that would not normally be here, all right? Typically, this muscle is fully contained down here on the bottom of the foot, but instead, it originates down there. Well, I guess it, I, I'm just saying it inserts down there, but, and, it, uh, all right, let me start over. This muscle is usually fully contained on the bottom of the foot, so it starts and ends down here. Instead, it's ending down there, but it's beginning way, way, way up here, and even farther up. Look at how far up this guy goes. Here's the connective tissue, way up here. All right. So this is a muscle that's typically completely self-contained in the foot and instead it extends way, way up here. This one is called quadratus plantae. We're not, don't even put it in there yet. Uh, don't, I'll come back. I'm going to re-show you this when I show you where it properly is and then we'll see how it extends up. So we'll, we're going to rename this one later. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to move it out of the way for now like that. We're just going to pretend it's not there and we're just going to move it out. Now, once we get this guy out of the way, everything looks normal. It's just that our first view would be this thing kind of sitting on top of this other stuff, and we're not going to worry about that right now. Just going to move it out like that. All right, now we're getting the view uh, where we would, this is what we would normally see and what we would expect to see. So when we're looking here, we have a little bit of vasculature. Here's arteries and veins and nerves right there. So we're just going to tuck these guys in. That's usually where they sit. They kind of nestle in right there. And you're going to see three separate muscles here. Right? You're going to have one, be this guy, that's one. Two is going to be this one here. And three is going to be this one here, this one. So we have three muscles there. And in between the second and the third is where we have the arteries and the veins. All right. So those three muscles, in order from medial to lateral, are going to be tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum, longus, flexor, hallucis, longus. Those are going to be the three. Tibialis posterior, flexor, digitorum, longus, and flexor, hallucis, longus. All right. So let's get these guys over a little bit. So here's the first one. Tibialis posterior, that's one. Flexor, Digitorum longus, that's two. And then flexor hallucis longus, that's three. All right, so that'll be the order. Now, what's the giveaway for these? You could do it, and I could say if I'm here, right, I would I would have I would have I would start off zoomed out a little bit. So I'd say I'm gonna take these muscles here, the calf muscles, and I'm gonna reflect them out of the way. And I would say we're gonna zoom in on this area, which we already are here, and clearly we're on that posterior medial compartment, right? And I would say here we have three muscles. All right, we got one, two, three muscles. And I want you to identify the first one or the second one or the third one. So I might group them together like that. I will also show you where they attach distally. So let's just slide down just to touch so you can see a little bit more of the bottom of the foot. Okay. And tibialis posterior, the first one, let's move this stuff over a little bit that first muscle there, that one ends right down here on the bottom medial side of the foot here, okay? Does not make it down to the toes at all. Ends on the bottom medial side of the foot. So the fact that it does not touch the toes tells you which one is it, that it is, which is tibialis posterior. The second one, this guy, all right? This one, uh, flexor digitorum longus, that one, where is it going? To digits two through five. And look here, I'm going to move this out of the way for a second. And here's the tendon for this one. You can see me 
pulling on it and then watch right here see that right so this is the tendon for it down here and then that tendon is going to split apart and go down to digits two through five down there all right it's going to hit all these guys here so that'll be and i'm going to show you that so i would say identify this muscle here the second one identify that muscle and then i would show you that it goes to this tendon i would grab the tendon here this tendon here and attaches here 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 point to the four toes so that's going to be the giveaway for that one flexor digitorum longus now the other one the third one which is this guy flexor hallucis longus we go where's that going we know that it has that name hallucis in there which is for your hallux which means it's going to the big toe so that one goes down i'm mean, gonna again i'm gonna move this stuff out of the way for a second here's the tendon for that one you can see it moving here all right you can see it moving that we can see that a little bit right now yeah you see it moving that tendon there and then that is going to go right down to the big toe so i would say identify this muscle here which goes to this tendon here which goes to here all right so i'm pretty much giving you the answer on those if you know what you're choosing between based on what i point to you'll know exactly what you're looking at all right so for those three muscles um all of them cross the posterior medial side of the ankle joint so they're all plantar flexors because they're posterior they're shortening up on the medial side of the foot which means they take the bottom of the foot and they turn it in right like that and i know i'm messing up that autofocus but that would be inversion of the ankle so they're plantar flexors and inverters all three now for tibialis posterior the first one that is all it does but for the other two that go down to the digits they're flexing those digits as well so flexor digitorum longus is flexing digits two through five flexor hallus as long as is flexing digit one all right uh so we know that has those additional cap capabilities those are all the muscles that are on the posterior leg so again just know i know we're only seeing a little bit but that's because up here without you being in person trying to pick out what is happening here is very hard to see even if you were here in person you'd have to really spend a little bit of time and look at it closely so that's why i'm really just concentrating on where you know creating a little space here and just concentrating on those muscles where we can really see the division one two three right there that's where we can see it well that's where i'll ask it and then you'll i'll also show you where they attach to to give you further clarification okay so let's put that other little muscle back in place there remember we're going to come back to that one now what we want to do is move down to the plantar side of the foot all right, so we're going to totally change the camera angle here because even even just kind of coming up like this is no good. What I'm going to do instead, so I'm going to turn this way and show it to you like this. So we're going to look straight on to the bottom of the foot here, something like that. Okay, if I can just get it to not droop down. slide there we go all right so we're going to look at it this way so we're looking down at the bottom of the foot here's the calcaneus the heel you can see the toes pretty well there all right now um first thing you want to know is that the bottom of the foot is called the plantar side of the foot that's where we are plantar side we did dorsal side last time now we're doing plantar side note that the plantar side of the foot is um similar to the palm side of your hand. All right, so things we saw on the palm side of the hand, we will see similar things down here on the plantar side of the foot. So the first bit is this piece of connective tissue that's right in the middle. And you can see I can I can move it around a little bit here. See this connective tissue right there? And I'm gonna kind of outline it, all of this. This is called your plantar aponeurosis. And that's very similar to that flap of connective tissue we had covering over the palm. All right, which is the palmar aponeurosis. Here we have plantar aponeurosis. Now remember when we looked at the palm of the hand, we had that palmar aponeurosis in the middle. And then on either side, we had a cluster of muscles at the base of the thumb, and we had a cluster of muscles at the base of the pinky finger. And that were your thenar and hypothenar eminences. That was back in that lab on the palm side of the hand. On here, 
we, ha we have eminences as well. So here's the connective tissue, and then we have a group of muscles over here, right, on big toe side of the foot, and we have a group of muscles over here on the little toe side of the foot. And this is going to be your medial plantar eminence and your lateral plantar eminence. Right? This is the medial side of the foot. That's the lateral side of the foot, right? Medial plantar eminence, lateral plantar eminence. And the first thing we want to do is identify the muscles that are located within those eminences. And just need, what are the, oh, here it is. Just need my forceps here. Okay, so here, um, unlike the hand, so up in the hand, we had, um, we had three muscles in each one of those eminences, right? Down here in the foot, we're only going to have two in each one of the eminences. Um, and the reason for that is because the, the third muscle that was located in, up in your hand were opponent's muscles. Remember, we had opponent's pollicis and opponent's digiti minimi, and that allowed you to do this, to do opposition. We, do, we can't do opposition in our feet, so we don't have those opponent's muscles down here. All right, we're missing those, but we do have the other two, and that would be um, flexor muscle and an abductor muscle, B as in boy. So over here in the medial plantar eminence, we're going to have a abductor, B as in boy, hallucis muscle, and a flexor hallucis brevis muscle. That'll be the two over here, and on the little toe side, in the lateral plantar eminence, we're going to have an abductor, B as in boy, digiti minimi, and a flexor digiti minimi. We're not going to have opponent's muscles down here. All right, so let's see if we can identify the difference between these. So to see these well, what I'm going to do is take all of this here. So I'm going to take that plantar aponeurosis, and there's a muscle you can see here attached to the underside of it, which we'll do in a second. I'm going to take that. I'm just going to move it out of the way for a second. Just let that drop down. That way we can see this a little better. And here, all right, so what I'm seeing is I did not separate these two well. So let's do this right now. Forgot to separate these guys. This is where you think you did everything, and then you realize at the end that you missed a couple things. And that's pretty typical. So I'm just opening up some fascia here so we can get this stuff separated get all this fashion out of the way something like that that and that's good let's just open this up a little now we're going to have some connection between these things. So these muscles are kind of stuck together a little bit. So I'm, I am chopping just a couple of like, uh, connective tissue connections between these muscles a little bit, because there is a lot of what I call crossover on these muscles where they're next to each other. So they tend to be connected together just a touch. So we're just going to separate that a little, get through there. There we go. All right. So now, if we kind of move this out of the way, oops, let's get this. So this is the tendon for flexor hallucis longus. I'm just going to hold that tendon over a little. All right, we got a little nerve in here and right here. See this guy out on the side? All of this, so we can see it here. This guy, I'm just going to kind of outline it. Right in there. That is your abductor, B as in boy, hallucis muscle abductor halysis all the way on the medial side of the foot that's abductor halysis and then this guy that i'm moving right here see this whole thing right there that i'm moving that is flexor halysis brevis and notice to see how there's like i don't know if you guys can see this groove in the middle of it right there that is where the tendon for longest typically sits like that right in the middle of it, all right? So we just had that tendon for longest out of the way, so we can see this is all flexor hallucis brevis. And you want to note that this muscle, we're not seeing it really well. Again, this is, it's messy. It's, if you're not here in person, be able to really lean in. It's a little hard to see. But flexor hallucis brevis forks like this. It splits. It's two different parts that come up. So we're not really seeing the fork too much, but 
if we followed that groove up a little farther, the muscle would actually separate a little bit. All right, but those are the two over here in the medial plantar eminence. Abductor hallucis, flexor hallucis brevis. So let's put that tendon back in place there. Let's go over to this side. Now, I don't remember if I separated these either. I might have thought I did this, and I think I forgot. So let's, let's see. We got it a little bit there. All right, so we're going to have to do the same thing here, and that is separate these guys just a touch. So same thing. These muscles are largely connected together. So we're going to separate them a little this Something like that Get you out of the way there there we go so you see this muscle I'm moving and it's going to go quite a bit farther up but eh, you know what maybe we can get this a little bit better so let's up here there we go so this guy a little bit more like that so this whole muscle that I'm moving here and we'll just kind of outline it like this all the way down there that is going to be abductor digitime minimi that one all the way out on the side okay and then right next to it I didn't separate this side either oh boy just give me one second here I'm realizing I missed a, forgot to do something when I was doing all this stuff. Let's get that guy there and right in here. Let's see if we can just separate this a little bit. Something like that. Oops. Oops. Okay. So we got these muscles here. We got this one. And then right next to it, this guy that I'm grabbing right here. Those would be the two. All right. And I know it's a little, it's still connected a little bit in here. Don't worry about it too much. I would just say this area here kind of outline this whole region and maybe you can see it better if we kind of whoops leave that in place yeah maybe like that so I'd say over here in this region right we have two muscles one two I want you to identify this one or that one and that would be abductor digitime minimi flexor digitime minimi there those two okay so this would be the ones located in the eminences. Now, um, next one we're going to do is the muscle that's located on the underside of the plantar aponeurosis. So we're going to take the aponeurosis, we're just going to turn it over, and we can see there's a muscle adhered to the underside of it. This one, look at, look at the tendons here. Let's get this out of the way. See these tendons? Right? This is going to go down to, and you can see... See how there's three tendons there? You guys see that? There should be a fourth. We have another small variation here. So there should be a fourth one, and they would go down, obviously, to the digits two through five, right? So this is going to be a digitorum muscle. This whole guy here that's on the underside of the aponeurosis, you can see it like that. That is going to be flexor digitorum brevis, right? But again, notice how it's only got three parts, so it doesn't have any part going to the pinky toe. That's common. A lot of times that part might be missing in this muscle, and it is on this body, although it's present a little deeper, and I'll just kind of show you where. So we got those guys there. And then look at this. Let's see how well we can see this. Move this out of the way. You guys see this real tiny little thing right here? See that? Okay. That has, here's a tendon. There's a little tendon and a little contractile belly right here. It's very, I don't know how well that's showing up, but you can see a little bit of contractile tissue right there, right? This part should have been up here. It should have been on this muscle. It should have started right here. Right, so let's just put it over to the side. Let's see if we can do this. Let's put this back 
like this, like this, like this, and like that. Oh, no, can I get my hand under here? So I need the contrast of my gloves a little bit. How is that? See that there? That's what that should have been like. So this muscle, that last little bit, should have originated here and gone down to the little toe. And this would have been flex. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry about that. This would have been flexor digitorum brevis. That's what it should look like. But notice, I can move this guy out of here. And this other one, this little bit, originates way down up here, right? So it's just, it should have been a part of that muscle, but it originated from one of the deeper ones instead. It's a little variation. It's not a big deal. It's nothing you guys even need to worry about. I'm not even going to ask you about it. It's just something interesting to see that the body doesn't always develop the way it's supposed to. I mean, when we say supposed to put that in quotation marks, because um, one thing that I do usually mention is that every variation that of your body that's possible to exist that still could sustain life, you will see if you look at enough cadavers. Okay. So you're going to see every single variation under the sun, things that are totally the wrong spot, originate from the wrong spot, you know, go to the wrong spot. You're going to see arteries and veins and nerves branch completely differently, originate from different spots, um, that they might not even merge from your spinal cord at the same level. That happens all the time. So meaning that somebody whose nerve that controls the muscles in the bottom of their foot originates from, let's say, the, the S4 level or something like that, you know, um, that somebody else it might come out of S3 or something, you know, like it, it could be from a different level of the spine, uh, that none of that stuff is consistent. It's normalized. So it's like on average, most people, it goes this way or that way. But if you look at enough cadavers, you will see variations to pretty much everything. Again, as long as it sustains life. I mean, if we have a variation that just can't, doesn't work, well, then that person wouldn't have survived. And you're not going to see it, right? But if, if they could survive, you will see it. Um, so all these little things, remember that all of your reference materials are just averages. It's not written in stone. It's just what you would see most of the time. So you always got to be on the lookout for little changes like that that might be different. All right. So again, we got that flexor digitorum brevis there. Again, that little part right there of that other bit. All right. So we're going to get that flexor digitorum brevis out of the way. And again, just note that it's attached to the underside of the plantar atherosis. So we reflect that down. Now, the next thing we uncover is those tendons that we saw before. So this is the flexor hallucis longus tendon. And here, this guy right here, let's move that over a little bit. And let's just get my fingers underneath of this right here. This, what I have what I'm grabbing there, that is the flexor digitorum longus tendon, right? And then notice how that splits and we can see four tendons. So we have this guy comes down, splits four times and it goes out to each one of your toes. So these are the tendons for the flexor digitorum longus muscle. You can see go to the fifth digit, fourth digit, third digit, second digit there. And this is where they're all joined together here. Okay. Now, once we found this tendon, the tendon for flexor digitorum longus, you're going to note that tendon, and that's going to allow us to find two different muscles here. One that's going to be proximal to this spot that I'm holding up here, and a group of muscles are going to be distal to that spot down there. So again, you find that flexor digitorum longus tendon, we go proximally or distally. If we go proximally, we see this muscle here. See this one. Then I'm moving. Me, so I don't cut it, grab it with my scissors on accident. Let's grab it like this. See this guy that I'm moving right there? That is quadratus plantae. Right, this muscle here. Notice how this is the one that was an anomaly that went up a little farther. So normally this muscle is contained right where we see it right here. This would be the whole thing. I'd be grabbing the whole thing. That's it. That'd be all of it. All right. And it originates on the bottom of the foot and inserts here onto that flexor digitorum longus tendon. So it connects to the tendon. But in this particular body, this one extends up a little further. So I'm gonna come back to that in one second. So that's quadratus plantae. But while we're right here, again, we're gonna go distal and down in here, let me just get that guy out of there like that. So we're highlighting those tendons here, 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 here. And notice how next to the tendon, see this, we got a muscle there, we got another muscle right here. We got another muscle 
right there. Those are lumbrical muscles. All right, and the lumbricals down here are located big toe side of each one of the tendons for your flexor digitorum longus muscle. So we go to the first tendon here, we go big toe side, first lumbrical. Second tendon, second lumbrical. Third tendon, and look at there's a gap. Missing that third lumbrical, just not there. Okay, which is fine. Again, variation. Then we got the fourth tendon, and we got the fourth lumbrical. So here we're missing the third. We got the first, second, no third, and then a fourth lumbrical. Right? So again, you find the tendons and you go big toe side. Here's the big toe of each one of those tendons, and you should see four lumbricals again here. You can very clearly see that gap where you can see the forceps there when we're missing the third. But we do have the first, the second, and the fourth lumbrical. And again, that's just him. I didn't cut that lumbrical out. It just wasn't there. Just gone. All right. Uh, so let's take another look at quadratus lumborum. Let's just go up a little bit. Let's see if we can see the whole thing here. I think I can get it just barely. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What did I say? Did I say quadratus lumborum? <laughs> I'm mixing up terms there. No. Uh, quadratus plantae. That's the one in the spinal muscle. That, oh. That's up in the spine. We did that one last last time. Sorry about that. Yeah, quadratus plantae. Uh, and, and I know sometimes I, I do mix up my terms. And that's where if we were in person, somebody would have raised their hand and went, you know, besides Alex, because he's watching out for you guys, he would have said, wait a second. You said, I think you said that wrong. You know, so sometimes I get my words mixed up. I apologize about that. Yeah, so quadratus plantae down here. So I just moved up a little bit. So here's that same tendon. Here's quadratus plantae. And then this is also quadratus plantae. You see how when I pull on it, see how it moves it? A little bit there, right? So this muscle belly, instead of, it should have originated on the uh, tarsal bones, on the bottom of the foot right here. But instead it went up through here. You can see, look at that passageway. See that? Went up through here and that contractile belly continued up, 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 all the way up here, all the way all the way up there. That's all the same muscle. And that typically does not happen. That's not something that we normally see. I can't, it doesn't want to pull, but you can see it that way, right? It is pulling a little bit there. So that is quadratus plantae up here as well. It's just a variation, but this is where you would normally identify it. All right. So when I ask you this one, I could ask you like an extra credit saying, you know, up there, Saying, hey, what, what muscle is that a part of that's typically not located in that area? You say quadratus plantae. If I just wanted to straight identify quadratus plantae, I would do it down here. I would grab, I'd grab this tendon and I'd say, okay, we got this tendon here, which you can see splits. We're going to start on this tendon. We're going to go proximally. I want you to identify this muscle that's connected to that tendon, quadratus plantae. Or I would say from this tendon, we're going to go a little distally and right here. And we can see that we have one, two, four muscles missing that third one. I want you to identify those, and that would be lumbricals. Or I might say in this area, right, in this area here, located next to these tendons, which muscle is missing right there? Which muscle is missing here? You say third lumbrical. So there's a couple things I could ask you here which would make it kind of specific to this body. Right? Associate all of those things with the flexor digitorum longus tendon. Be able to find that and then note that those other muscles will be located around it. All right. So function. What do these muscles do for us? Well, quadratus plantae, all right, it attaches to the tendon for flexor digitorum longus. So it affects that tendon. That's important to remember. And look at what happens here. Look at the tendon for flexor Digitorum longus. Let me zoom if I grab it here. We can see it better. Yeah, let's do that. Now look at what happens if I shift this tendon back and forth. And look what happens. If I if I pull the tendon laterally, it tightens up this connective tissue. And look at how loose this is. See, this is very, very loose. See, I can move that all over the place. But this guy, this I can't really move much at all because it's tight, right? What happens when I go the other way? 
the opposite thing happens. Look at how this is very, very tight now. See, I can't really move it. But look at how loose this guy is. See how loose that is? And see how the, the tension shifts from one side to the other as I move this tendon back and forth like that, right? So that affects how your toes, let me get that out of the way, that affects how your toes contract, okay? Depending on where this is. So normally, things that contract our fingers or our toes, we want to pull from the center of the foot or the hand, right? So we would ideally want uh, digitorum muscles to pull straight from the middle like this, and that would cause all your toes to contract evenly. Now that is what flexor digitorum brevis does, right? So we go here, here's flexor digitorum brevis. Where does that one originate from? The calcaneus right there in the middle, right? So when that muscle contracts and it contracts the toes, it's pulling straight from the middle of the foot. But look here, here's the tendon for flexor digitorum longus, right? Here's the calcaneus. Clearly this tendon is pulling this way right, from the medial side. It's not pulling from the middle of the foot, it's pulling from over here, which means that this tendon, when it contracts, is always gonna be shifted this way, like this, it pulls like that, which means that your little toe, that side is very, very tight, and the second digit, the index toe, is very, very loose. What would happen then? It would look like this. If that muscle only pulled this way, your toes would contract like this right? Where the index toe would barely move. It would, it would probably do that a little bit, but your pinky toe would be like locked down like that, but they wouldn't contract evenly. If that makes sense, they would be like this. All right. So what do we do? When this tendon pulls in this direction, quadratus plantae contracts at the same time and moves the tendon back over towards the middle. So you see the orientation of this muscle, it's gonna pull this way and it shifts the tendon over like this so that it acts like it pulls from the center of your foot instead of pulling from the medial side. All right, so quadratus plantae is a corrective muscle. It corrects the tracking angle of flexor digitorum longus. All right, tracking angles, you will learn about tracking angles much more if you go into biomechanics or kinesiology, all right? But the tracking angles are angles we associate with tendons to um, show what their correct pull angle is, right? So every, every muscle in your body has a particular tracking angle that's optimal for it, right? And this one is not optimal. It's pulling from the wrong side. So we have another muscle that fixes the track, right? If instead, let's just say, that flexor digitorum longus acted like your muscles that operate your, your fingers this way. Where do the muscles that operate your digits, digits two through five, where do they go through to get to your fingers? They go through the carpal tunnel. So we have an opening, a passageway directly in the center of your palm that allows these muscles to go through and pull from the middle. We don't have a calcaneal tunnel down here. If we did, if we drilled a hole in the calcaneus, your heel bone, and we cut this tendon and threaded it through that hole, well, then you wouldn't need quadratus plantae anymore because it would pull from the middle. But instead, calcaneus, big uh, muscle that doesn't have a passageway, the muscles that operate the toes remotely, the ones that are located up in your leg that operate the toes, they have to go around the calcaneus one way or the other. So we, so we need some corrective muscles to fix that. So long-winded explanation, but it is important to understand why that muscle exists. All right. Um, and then the lumbrical muscles down here, they do the same thing that they do in your hand, which is to um, flex the digits at the intersection between the metatarsals and the phalanges like that. Right. So I can't demonstrate it with my toes, but it'll be flexing a straight toe at the joint between the phalanges and the metatarsals here. All right, so at the joint right here, it would be flexing an extended toe. So keep your toes straight, but bend at that proximal phalangeal joint. All right, that would be the lumbricals. Okay, so uh, next muscle we want to find is going to be your adductor hallucis muscle. D is a dog, adductor hallucis. Um, and we're going to note that this one has two heads. And hopefully we can see both. Um, it has an oblique head 
and a transverse head. All right, so we're going to look for a muscle. Now, it's underneath of all this stuff. We're going to look for a muscle that is pulling on the big toe. It's adductor halysis. And adduction of the big toe is to move the big toe towards the other ones, from here to there, like that. That's what we're looking for, something that does this to that. So it's got to pull this way, right? So oblique head pulls like this. Transverse head pulls like that, like the name suggests. So we have two, two heads, and they're going to look like this, both pulling that way. Oblique transverse and they're going to be underneath of this stuff so let's see how if i can get this to come out well here yeah we can see it right there so let's move this guy over hold all this stuff out of the way like that and see if I can highlight those two there. All right. So this guy, this is oblique head of adductor halysis. That's the oblique one. This one right here is the transverse head. We can see that pretty well, right? That looks a decent picture. All right. So again, I would, I would highlight right here and say, I want you to identify this muscle. It's got two heads, one, two. I want this one going in that direction, or I want this one going in that direction, like that, right? So you can really see those guys there. Oblique head, transverse head. And both of them are going to operate on the big toe. All right, I don't know if you, if you can sort of see them work a little bit. Not really. If you guys were here, you could lean in a bit closer, but they're really small. All right, but I think we can see the difference between those two decently well there. All right, so that takes care of those. Um, and then the last group of muscles that we would have here are going to be your interosseous muscles. And there are two sets of interosseous muscles. We have plantar and dorsal interosseous muscles. I don't know if we're going to even be able to get these guys. Well, let me see. Let me just see if I can move stuff out of the way enough. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to see the separation of these well enough, but this is what we're going to note. And maybe, I mean, we can sort of see it here. All right. See what I'm grabbing right there. These are all of your interosseous muscles. These are the plantar and dorsal interosseous muscles all together. And what it does is they're kind of lined up next to each other. So you have a plantar interosseous, and then a dorsal interosseous, then a plantar, then a dorsal, then a plantar, and a dorsal. And they're all kind of next to each other right in this area that I have here. Um, it's not the best picture. It's a tough spot to uh, dissect, especially if we're leaving everything else intact. If I don't cut all this stuff out of the way, it's a little hard to see those guys down there. But you're going to note that all of the interosseous muscles are located in between flexor um, – digiti minimi, and the oblique head of adductor halysis. That that's where you're going to find the interosseous muscles, in between flexor digiti minimi and the oblique head of adductor halysis. And that's basically, again, right uh, where either side of the forceps are right now. All right. So again, you can note that I probably won't even ask those interosseous ones. The picture is kind of bad. Um, but just, just kind of know where they are. All right, and what do the interosseous muscles do for us? Same thing they did in the hands. So we had palmar and dorsal interosseous muscles up in the hands, and that did this. Uh, dorsal interosseous muscles, the ones on the back of the hand, spread the fingers apart. Dorsal interosseous muscles here, spread the toes apart. Um, palmar interosseous muscles brought digits two through five back together. Plantar interosseous muscles bring digits two through five in your feet back together. All right, so it's abduction and adduction. Uh, dorsal side ones abduct, B as in boy. Palmer or plantar side ones adduct, D as in dog, digits two through five. All right, so that takes care of all of the muscles and that's by far the, the bulk of what we need to do. Now, what we have left is a little bit of vasculature and then a little bit of nervous tissue. And it's not that much. All right. So we're going to refer to our drawings again. 
and I'll be holding it up underneath the, the camera. Sorry, let me fix this. Let's come back up here. Let's get back up to the gluteal region. Something like that. Let's turn this out a little bit. There we go. All right. And let's get this down. Let's open back up the glutes. So let's put all this stuff back here. First, let me grab our picture. Uh, all right, so we're looking at lower limb arteries, and we're going to be over here on the posterior side. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here. And what are we looking for? In this area, you see this letter A. Okay, that is a continuation of this right here. And you see that is your internal iliac artery that was up in the abdomen. We did that. And that dives deep, and it comes out over here in the gluteal region. And we're going to see that internal iliac artery is going to split into your superior gluteal arteries and your inferior gluteal arteries. All right, so we want to see where these arteries emerge. Now, you're not going to see the, the split from internal into superior and inferior gluteals. Why? Because a muscle covers up that transition. Let me use my probe here to show you, but be like this. So there's a muscle sitting right on, actually let's use this point like this, sitting right on top of that, like here. And that is gonna be piriformis. All right, so piriformis is gonna cover that split right there. But what we will see is where these vessels emerge above or below piriformis. All right, so that's how you're going to find these. Superior gluteal arteries emerge superior to piriformis. Inferior gluteal arteries emerge inferior to piriformis. All right, so how are we going to find this? We're going to open up gluteus maximus both ways like this. We're going to find piriformis. How did we find piriformis? We located the sciatic nerve here, and we traced it proximally up, up, up until it pointed to that first hip stabilizer muscle, piriformis. All right, so here we got piriformis. So let's just, let's just put a probe underneath that to highlight it a little bit. There we go. So we got piriformis up here. Now, what we're looking for are vessels that are emerging above or below piriformis. Now, we have to discount. We're not looking for nerves here. All right, this is a sciatic nerve, so don't worry about that. What we are looking for is this stuff up here. And, uh, let's see how well we can see this. All of these things, see what I'm moving right there? Those are all inferior gluteal arteries and veins. And you notice how here's piriformis, we're below piriformis here, inferior gluteal. And that comes up and does gluteus maximus, and they're going to continue down this way to hit some of the other muscles down in this area. But this would all be inferior gluteal branches here. And again, the key is that all this stuff is emerging below piriformis. And I know this is not the cleanest picture. I cleaned it as best as I possibly could. Hopefully with me moving it a little bit, you can see it. All right, but it is branching a whole bunch of times here. Inferior gluteal. Now, superior gluteal, and I'm just going to just change this to the other side so it's not blocking us quite so much. Maybe like that. So we're still going to hold up piriformis. Now we're going to take gluteus medius, and we're just going to move gluteus medius over a little bit. And again, this is not the best picture, but what I'm moving right here, right, all of this stuff that I'm moving a little bit here, this is emerging right above piriformis. Hopefully you guys can see that a little bit. These are all of the superior gluteal vessels. So this is superior gluteal arteries and veins. And they're going to continue underneath of um, gluteus medius and on top of gluteus minimus down there. But we can see where it emerges at least right there a little bit. All right, you can see that spot that I'm moving right there. Okay, That's superior gluteal. So again, you're finding piriformis, and we're just looking at stuff coming above or below piriformis. Now it would be superior and inferior gluteal arteries and veins. And then they're going to supply all the stuff in the gluteal region. And the inferior one, depending upon the person, might continue down a bit farther, but for the most part, they're relatively self-contained up in the gluteal region, just kind of supply blood and drain blood from all this stuff. 
All right. So those would be the gluteal vessels. That's all you really need there. Just find piriformis and then note the stuff going emerging uh, below or above. And also be able to just visually separate the sciatic nerve because that we're going to do separately. But that's pretty easy to see there. All right. Now, let's move down a little bit. So we go down to posterior thigh. And let's just refer to our drawing. Let's go down to posterior thigh. Posterior thigh, and we go, there's not much there. Why? Because it originated from the anterior side here. So remember when we did deep femoral? Here's deep femoral going down this way. And we had those branches coming off, and those were perforating arteries. So we saw that last time. We saw where the perforating arteries originate. And the perforating arteries, what do they do? They perforate through adductor magnus to be able to supply the hamstrings with blood. So we don't have, I'm not showing anything here because they're all coming from this side to the muscles over here, but they don't originate from anything here. So if we want to see the perforating arteries, what are we going to do? We're going to grab the hamstring muscles and we're just going to lift them up a little bit. And let's see, see like this here. All right. So you see like these vessels, see this, what I got here, it's, it's diving down that way. Where can I see a good, sorry, just looking for a good spot. And you know what happened is again, a, a vessel burst down here. So it's all stained. It's a little tough to see well, but eh, if we go, eh, yeah, it's a little messy, but you can't see it, but where all this stuff is originating from, see all this stuff that I'm grabbing? It's coming, it's a popping out of, boy, we really can't see it, but it's coming through adductor magnus, like right there. Those would all be perforating vessels, all this stuff that's coming up into the hamstrings this way. This, and that, and this. And you see this, this bit is emerging like right there. See all that? See how it come up? Those would all be perforating vessels there. All right, so there are things supplying the hamstrings, but they're originating from the anterior side, which we already did. So that's the only thing you need on the posterior thigh. Now we're going to move down a little bit farther, so we're looking more at the posterior knee. So let's just slide down, touch here, and here, here's the back of the knee joint right here. So this is the popliteal, let me just put the cap muscles back in place. So here's, here's the popliteal fossa in here. Right, And coming through there, you see these big vessels we got here. These are your popliteal artery and veins, popliteal. And these are a continuation of your femoral artery and veins. All right, so look here. Look on the drawing. And we see right here, see this letter B where we have this stuff emerging? That is right here. See where the probe is going? Up in there, that's right where we're popping out here for that letter B. And where did that come from? Here, we come over to this side, and that was your femoral artery going down and going into that passageway that we talked about, which was the adductor canal or the adductor hiatus. So we passed through that. And I showed that to you on the anterior side. If you don't remember it, go back and look at the last recording. And then we're going to come out of the adductor canal on the posterior side, and we're going to call it popliteal artery now instead of femoral. So here, this one's the vein. This is the artery. So artery, vein, we got both of those things and we can push up here. Here's the passageway that they're emerging from. See right here and push the probe into it. So I could say, identify these vessels here in this area and you say that that's your popliteal artery and vein, right? Artery, vein, artery is a little bit more medial, vein's a little bit more lateral there. And what passageway are they emerging from there? Adductor hiatus. Or I could say identify this passageway, right? Identify that passageway that the probe is going into. You say adductor hiatus and I say, I wanna know what these vessels are called before that passageway and after that passageway. And that would be femoral artery and vein up here before it and popliteal artery and vein after. So there's a couple different questions I could ask it a couple different ways in that area. That's where we'd be. Now, we follow these guys down as they cross the back of the knee. So we follow the popliteal vessels down and we can see we're looking for this first split here. And that's gonna be popliteal 
dividing into your anterior and posterior tibial arteries. So this we want to find. All right. So in order to see that, you can see how this stuff kind of dives down and see it's going underneath of your calf muscles here. All right. If we follow these vessels down, see them right here. They go here. So what do we got to do? We got to get these guys out of the way. So if you want to follow this down, you're going to reflect gastrocnemius plantaris soleus. We're going to get this out of the way, this out of the way, this out of the way. And we're just going to move this stuff over a little. And this is, this is also the veins. We're going to get that out of here. So we're really just going to try to look at the artery. And I guess we're going to have to go this way with it. Yeah, like that. I think that's good right there. All right. So here's that popliteal artery, right? This is the artery continuing. This is a, a vein. This is vein over here, right? We're just going to concentrate on the artery. I think if we go this way that. And if I put my finger behind it, it's a little, sorry, Let's see if we can... like that there. I think we can see that split, right? Like that a little bit. Okay. So that is where popliteal is splitting into posterior and anterior tibial, right? So the split is like this. Posterior stays on this side. Anterior dives down towards the anterior side like that. So we're looking here. Anterior posterior. And let's just grab it one more time right there. And wow, really tough to see if I don't put my finger behind it, but Jesus, come on, stay on. Let's not slip off. There we go, right there. So we can see it. Oh boy. Right like that. All right, that's about the best picture I'm going to be able to give you. There. We can zoom in a little bit on this. So let's let's zoom into this area. Let me touch. Maybe that'll help. Let's go a little closer. Yeah, maybe this will be better. Let's see. Yeah. Right? You can see that pretty good there. There you go. Yep. So Let's see if I can point, hold all this stuff and point at the same time. All right, so popliteal, anterior tibial, posterior tibial, anterior, posterior, right there like that. All right, so that's the first one you're going to find. Now, we're going to follow. Anterior tibial is the one that goes back to the front. We found that last time. So go back to that last recording and you'll see anterior tibial again. We want to follow posterior tibial down, and I'm just going to move down the touch because I can't see what I'm pointing to here. Right there. And here's posterior tibial, right? And hopefully you guys can see that divide or split here, right? So we can see that pretty well. And that's going to be posterior tibial, and then on this side, posterior tibial continuing down farther. And this one here is going to be your fibular artery going this way. Now here, this should make sense because we see these vessels doing this, right? And we know that the tibia is on the medial side of the leg. So the one going this way is still going to be posterior tibial. We know the fibula is on the lateral side of the leg. So that branch right there going that way, this way is going to be your fibular artery. You can see that split pretty good, right? Okay. So I think you could probably see all of it together if I do that there, right? So you can see anterior, posterior, and then fibular and posterior tibial continuing, right? So you can kind of see everything you need to see right there. All right. That's that. And that corresponds to this stuff right here. Okay. There was anterior, posterior, and then this was posterior tibial fibular. Now, this looks like it's going the other way because this is the other side. All right. Sorry, I've got the mirror image this for this side. Uh, all right, so you got those branches. Now, um, fibular ends up going down a little bit and it doesn't really make it past these muscles on the posterior medial compartment of the leg. But Posterior tibial, that one does continue down. So let's just kind of grab it. So this bundle right here, this is all 
posterior tibial stuff. So I'm just going to kind of hold on to that for a second. Let's move down. So you can still see we're on that same thing. And we're going to come down a little farther, right? Same thing. Here's that quadratus plantae muscle that shouldn't be here, right? We move this guy out of the way. Here's that same bundle. We're still on that stuff. This is all posterior tibial. Slide down a little bit more. Something like that. Right? There's posterior tibial. And this is arteries and veins together. And I think, whoops, oh, Jesus, I'm trying to steady the camera. I just basically punched my camera. Sorry about that. When we're zoomed in, it's hard to get everything set. Now, I don't know how well you guys can see this, but see this darker bit right there versus the lighter bit right there? That's that, you know, that's a vein. There's the artery in the middle. And if I roll this just a little, we can see another darker bit right there. That's another vein. So remember, we're going to have the, the arteries flanked by these smaller veins. So again, you notice it's all, and there's a nice, you see that right there? There's a little connection between the veins wrapping around the artery there. You can see that, right, Alex, a little bit? Yeah. So that's that, what I showed you when we did the upper extremity, how the arteries and veins are all bundled together, right? So we follow this down a little farther, and I'm going to turn this out a little right here. Let's get this guy out of the way. And here I separated, I actually separated the veins a little bit. So there's a vein. There's a vein. Here's the artery right there. You see how it divides. As I move that, you see how it splits. So the artery comes down and the artery is doing this. And that is a branch going this way and a branch going that way. And that's going to be your posterior tibial artery splitting into your medial plantar artery going this way and your lateral plantar artery going that way. And you can see that split pretty good, right? Yeah, like that. Okay. So keep your eye on that spot. Let's go down just a little farther like this, and let's look down at the foot, and we're going to take that plantar aponeurosis and flexor digitorum brevis, and we're going to reflect it, okay, and let me grab my forceps again, so we got the artery here, okay, and it's going to continue down here, right, that's the medial side ones, which are staying over here. And the lateral side ones is this whole bunch of stuff right here. Okay. So lateral plantar arteries and veins going down towards the lateral plantar eminence and the medial plantar arteries and veins going down along the medial plantar eminence. That's as far down as we're going to follow the arteries and veins there. That's it. Okay. So notice here that you do have a plantar arch and some other stuff coming off there. We're not going to be able to see that well without cutting all this stuff out of the way. It's all deep to this. So we're just going to see those things going down that far. That's about it. All right. So that takes care of the arteries and the deep veins. Now, we do have a superficial vein. So remember, on the anterior side, our superficial vein was our great saphenous vein. On the posterior side, it's going to be its counterpart, which is called the small saphenous vein. So let's go up here onto the posterior leg. Let's put the calf muscles back in place here. All right, and let's grab this guy here. Just move some of this fascia back over like this. This guy that we see going right down along the midline of posterior legs. So this would be right up underneath your skin, running right down the center of your calf muscles here. And this would be your small saphenous vein, this guy. And we can see there's some branches kind of where it connects a little deeper. This is where it's going to drain into the deeper stuff here. You can see it continues up a bit farther, right? And it will drain again up a little higher. And here, this is coming down, 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 and it's going to pass the lateral side of your ankle joint. So great saphenous past the medial side of the ankle joint, small saphenous passes the lateral side of the ankle joint. Typically it goes posterior to the lateral malleolus. Or great saphenous, the one we did last time, passed anterior 
to the medial malleolus. That's just where they typically go. They don't have to go right there, but they most of the time they do go right there. And I did cut this, but look over here. Let's put this fascia back for a second. So you see here is the fascia. Would have covered over. See like that. You see this? See this branch right here? Right? That connected in. See so it kind of it connected in like right here to small saphenous. This is a branch off a of great saphenous. So here we have a connection as the blood is draining up this way. It can stay in the small saphenous pathway, or it could switch over, go around this way, and go connect into that great saphenous pathway. So a lot of times there is just a lot of variability in this. And you know this. If you look at any, go look up any bodybuilders who are extremely lean, where you can really see all those superficial veins. And just look at how different they all look. Right? You're going to see the patterns be completely different from one person to another, and that's totally normal. All right? So we're just going to be concerned with this right here, the main pathway that runs right up along the midline, posterior leg, small saphenous. Right? Again, goes behind the lateral malleolus, ends up on the dorsal side of the foot, top of the foot. So none of these superficial veins end up on the bottom of the foot, not on the plantar side. They all end up on the dorsal side of the foot, just like the superficial veins we did on the hand, none of them end up in the palm side of the hand. They all end up on the dorsal side of the hand. Same thing down on the foot. So it's very similar. Okay. So last thing we have are going to be the nerves. And there's just a couple. All right. Not a big deal here. Um, and again, we're not really seeing the plexuses here. We're not seeing the lumbar and the sacral plexus. We're seeing the terminal nerves that emerge from those uh, plexuses. All right. So let's go back up. Gluteal region. And let me just tilt this just a touch like that. And let's put the gluteal muscles back again. So we got gluteus maximus back in place. We're going to take gluteus maximus. We're going to reflect it here, here. What did we uncover here nerve-wise? Sciatic nerve. Okay, that's the one. We've already found this one because we used it to identify piriformis, which is that muscle there. So we got sciatic nerve. Follow the sciatic nerve distally. And as we follow this down, we're going to see it. You can see it going down the midline posterior thigh. All right, so I'm going to hold on to it here. Let's just slide down so we can follow this picture. Down, down, down. Now we got sciatic nerve going through posterior thigh. So it's right in between that split in our hamstring muscles, right in the middle. And we're looking for this right here, this division. A little bit of fatty tissue on there, right there, that division. And that is going to be your sciatic nerve splitting into your tibial and common fibular nerves. And notice, again, look at the split side to side, which bone is where. So we're here. The tibia is on the medial side. So that means this would be, let me just get this guy out of the way for a second like that. That would be your tibial nerve going that way towards tibia common fibular is pointing laterally towards where the fibula would be. So we got sciatic nerve splitting into tibial nerve, common fibular nerve, like that. Right? Tibial, common fibular. Now, let's talk about common fibular first. So we follow this guy down right to here, and I'm going to move gastrocnemius out of the way a little bit. All right, kind of move this over. And you see right here we expose soleus. Let me move gastroc over a little farther. There's soleus, right? We said, where did soleus originate? On a bony process right here, which is the head of the fibula. So right here, my fingers on the head of the fibula, there's soleus. Look at your common fibular nerve. There's the common fibular nerve. Especially look at it right. Just get some stuff out of the way right there. That bit of it. All right, and see how it's diving deep right here. It's passing around the head of the fibula, so the common fibular nerve goes right over that bony spot, wraps around the origin of your soleus muscle, and goes around to the anterior side of the leg right here. And we followed common fibular last time, and this nerve split into your deep and superficial fibular nerves, which we found last one. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is go back to the last recording, Look at the anterior leg where we're doing your shin muscles. And we found two nerves in that area, deep 
and superficial fibular nerves. Those are continuations off of common fibular nerve. I mentioned last time that we would see where they originate from, and it's right here. All right. So again, you got sciatic splitting in the tibial, common fibular, common fibular comes over. It passes around the head of the fibula right there, goes around to the anterior side, and then you pick it up again on the anterior side once it splits into your deep and superficial fibular nerves. So that's off of common fibular. Now, follow tibial nerve, and you can already see, see there's like branches coming off. These are all muscular and or cutaneous branches coming off of tibial nerve. And we're gonna see a bunch of them coming off. But we're gonna follow the main pathway. Tibial goes down, it goes underneath of your calf muscles here, right? So we're gonna take gastrocnemius and we're gonna reflect it. We're gonna take plantaris and soleus and reflect all of that, okay? And right here, oops, not scissors, not scissors. Here, we're gonna grab this. You can see, this here, oh boy. Right there, there. See how that's connected? So we got tibial nerve, comes down. Here is still your tibial nerve, like this. Now look, if I hold that out, see all those little branches coming off like this? Those are all muscular branches, right? So let me hold the tibial nerve here. We're gonna follow it down a little farther. And we got tibial nerve here. Again, we're gonna move that quadratus plantae muscle out of the way a little bit. Here's still tibial nerve. So it's right next to your posterior tibial artery vein. There's the artery vein. Here's the nerve. We're going to follow that down, down, down. And right here, we should be able to see this pretty well. Can you see that good? Okay. See that split? That is your tibial nerve splitting into your medial and lateral uh, plantar nerves medial and lateral plantar nerve. So we're having tibial nerve do the same division that the posterior tibial artery and veins did, which is split into medial and lateral plantar nerves. And if we move down just a touch more here, we can grab, there's the division right there, right there. Medial lateral plantar nerves and we can see that that is going to match up to this that's the medial plantar nerve going down along the medial plantar eminence and the lateral plantar nerve would be this guy see it moving right there going down towards the lateral plantar eminence but really you just need to worry about it right at that division right there and then just look at the direction Right, the one going to the medial side or the lateral side. Medial plantar nerve, lateral plantar nerve, right there. Okay, that is it. All right, so done with the posterior side. Um, you're going to want to go back, review that a bunch of times, use the drawings uh, to help you at least a little bit with the arteries and stuff, although that, it's not that bad. The, the vasculature is not hard in the lower extremity. Um, I will... Right now, I'm going to stop this. I will post up the link to this recording, and I will post up the quizzes from the spring semester with those notes that we talked about in the beginning about how the vasculature is a little different. So just make sure that you're referring to your own drawings and the recordings for our cadavers just for that one uh, proximal part where the subclavian axillary artery branches are and also for the one part off of the femoral artery just in the beginning. The rest of it you can use the quizzes for, but um, for those particular things, you're gonna to wanna to refer to our recordings. Uh, all right, if you guys have questions, ask them up in the chat. If not, I will see you guys on Wednesday for the practical. Um, if anybody needs any help sessions, just contact me. I'm gonna do one this afternoon. We haven't been getting really anybody doing the help sessions, which is fine. Typically happens towards the end of the semester. Uh, I get it, but if you do have questions, concerns about the upcoming practical, obviously, today, tomorrow, or the times to do it, okay? Otherwise, I will see you guys on Wednesday morning. Um, and again, you guys will have the option. You can attend the morning one or the afternoon one. Does not matter to me. I will do the morning one live. I will do the afternoon one off of the recording, uh, but they will still both be conducted live. It's just the morning one will have live video. The afternoon one will have recorded video with live audio, all right? 
just like we did last time. So no different. You're welcome to attend either one. I will make an announcement and post up or I probably send out an email uh, with all of that stuff uh, noted anyway. All right. So have a good one. If you have questions, stay on. Otherwise, I'll see you later. Thanks.